Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming in the second day of uh, the workshop uh, that we are organizing in the context of the Maria de Maestu strategic program. And um, uh, we are starting with a very special uh, keynote. Um, and uh, Victoria Stoden, uh, in fact, we are looking for someone to, to really uh, introduce us to the world of uh, reproducible research. When we started the, the program, we really wanted to be a uh, reproducible research uh, a fundamental topic, and we thought that uh, we could just uh, get a few examples of best practices and then just implement in the, in the department some uh, best practices, but it was not <coughs> that easy. And uh, maybe uh, from today's talk, we will realize that it's not that easy. So, uh, so we had to go to the, to the source and to uh, people that really know what uh, all the issues of uh, reproducible research uh, are. And uh, so definitely we, we run into Victoria for, for that. So in fact, let me just uh, read uh, her bio in the, on uh, her website and, uh, and then uh, we can go from there. So she's uh, definitely a, a leading figure in the area of uh, reproducible in computational science exploring how uh, can we better ensure the reliability and usefulness of scientific results in the face of increasingly sophisticated computational approaches to research. Her work addresses a wide range of topics, including standards of openness for data and code sharing, legal and policy barriers to disseminating reproducible research, robustness in replicating findings, cyber infrastructure to enable reproducibility, and scientific publishing practices. Stoden co-chairs the NSF Advisory Committee for Cyber Infrastructure and is a member of the NSF Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering Advisory Committee. She also serves on the National Academies Committee on Responsible Science, uh, ensuring the integrity of the research process. Previously, uh, she's now a uh, faculty at the uh, at, uh, um, in Illinois at the Graduate School of uh, Information Sciences. But uh, before that, uh, she was assistant professor of statistics uh, at Columbia University, and uh, where she taught courses in uh, data science, reproducible research, and statistical theory, and was affiliated with the Institute for Data Science and Engineering. Uh, she co-edited two books released in 2014, Privacy, Big Data, and the Public Good, uh, Frameworks for Engagement, published by Cambridge University Press, and another book on implementing reproducible research published by Taylor and Francis. Stoden earned both her PhD in statistics and uh, her law degree from Stanford University, and she also holds a master's degree in economics from the University of British Columbia and a bachelor degree in economics from University of uh, Ottawa. So I think from this, it's clearly that we have the person that can tell us uh, what uh, reproducible research is and uh, can enlighten us on a very uh, interesting topic. So thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to have you thank here. You. <coughs> well, it's really uh, a huge pleasure to be here. And I feel like now I know who I am, you know, this <laughs> <Yeah>. long. <laughs> um, so, wh so what I did is I put some slides together. And I found your, um, the discussion yesterday very interesting, and I tried to reflect some of that in the slides a little bit. So um, I also am going to try not to take the whole hour, so hopefully we have time for discussion. And I am very comfortable if you have questions on a slide or in the middle, just put your hand up and we can even just start the discussion right away. Because uh, I, think this is, I think this is actually what you're more interested in, is sort of learning and, and engagement. Okay, so I called the talk uh, Reproducibility in Computational Research, and what I thought I might do is parse through different ways to think about the term reproducibility. Um, one of the first things that you run into, I think, when you start trying to imagine what this might mean for your work is um, many different people have many different interpretations. So one of the things that I'm going to do is take um, uh, notions of reproducibility and try and ground them in some of the technological changes that I know and everybody's working in and, and everybody knows uh, has happened, but really sort of how do we tie those changes into reproducibility. And then I wanted to talk about um, scientific norms. Again, this is 
to help try to understand what reproducibility might mean when you actually implement it in your work. So um, it's one thing to, to say this in an abstract sense. It's another thing to think about well, what are we actually trying to do when we carry out the research? And how can our implementations of reproducibility really support what we're fundamentally trying to do in terms of discovery and in terms of the scientific method? Then I added this especially, so we have best practice um, principles. So it's not exactly what people want. I don't have um, a, a sort of a, a sort of flotilla of examples. However, I do have some nice examples. So I think it can support this. And then, then the discussion is really around the principles to keep in mind when um, implementing it in any particular situation. Uh, one thing that I've learned in the course of my research on this topic is the type of research people do is so highly varied. Even in one particular subject area, it can be um, extraordinarily different. So that has implications for what it means to actually produce work that other people can reproduce. And then I have a little bit of discussion on the end if we get there around what it means for the scholarly record. What can we, um, what mindset can we use to really imagine how we might start to behave in this world of radical transparency? And uh, much of the discussion over the last few years around reproducibility has really been along the lines of, well, we have a serious problem in terms of being able to understand even what our colleagues are doing when they publish a paper. But we'll, I am optimistic that we'll solve this problem. So five years, 10 years from now, we need to think ahead to what if we have all the code, all the data, all the methods, and everything is transparent, and this is a normal way that everybody just does their research. How should we think about what we disseminate, what the scholarly record should look like? So we keep this in mind, and I think we do sort of a little bit better in sort of sharing and sort of constructing ourselves for that future. <clears throat> okay, so um, everybody here knows these changes. I think it's very useful to pull them out in segments. So the first change that I like to pull out that, that really is driving why we have problems in reproducibility now is um, enormous amounts of data. Um, discovery that's driven from data. It's less driven by hypothesis. Working with, say, for example, very high dimensional data, you have many more variables than observations. So this has revolutionized, I don't think is really too strong a word, a number of fields, including, for example, in the social sciences now that they've become, to a large degree, a fully sort of quantitative um, endeavor as opposed to where they might have been 20 years ago with an enormous amount of theory involved as well. And so it's really kind of reconstructed how we think about how we do the research. So everybody knows that. Um, computational power, another one that people are aware of. It's, it, it's a lucky coincidence that we happen to have enormous amounts of um, uh, increases in computational power just when we happen to get um, increasing amounts of data. So we're able to do not just analyses on these large data sets in very sophisticated ways, but we can also do um, uh, uh, much more sophisticated simulations as part of the discovery, which is what some fields are built around, for example. So I think when you mention changes in technology that have um, really changed how we carry out scientific research, people will sort of mention those two. <clears throat> what I ne almost never hear anybody mention, although I think there was a little bit of it yesterday, um, another fundamental change is our contributions Scientific intellectual contributions are now appearing only in the software that's written to support um, scientific results. So this isn't something that appears in the publication itself. They're standing in the software. And so it makes me really consider software as um, a first class scholarly object with real intellectual contributions in it and that don't appear anywhere else in the, in the dissemination and in the publication. So I put a little screenshot there. That's uh, Lior Patchter, who is a professor at Berkeley in, um, I believe, mathematics and uh, biology. And he's giving a keynote, and I just took this screenshot off um, YouTube as he was uh, speaking. And he's saying how, for him, around his research, the software contains ideas that enable biology, not just in the paper, not just sitting, for example, in parsed data, but really in the software itself. Okay, two that I'll mention as well that um, uh, are in a sense also obvious, but also very important to think about when we start reconceptualizing dissemination. 
so the first one, of course, uh, we are moving things into the internet. Now that's um, very obvious, but on the other hand, thinking about just sort of keeping that in the back of our minds is one of the technological changes when we start thinking about how we are going to reinvent uh, the scholarly record and dissemination as we become radically transparent. Uh, the other example um, is often overlooked uh, in my experience, which is when we start sharing things openly on the internet, we run immediately into, into, into intellectual property problems. So um, one of the things that I've done in my research, I won't talk about it too much this morning, but I have a number of papers on how to share your work in such a way that others actually can use it um, can build on it and extend it in a legal sense. And the default is you can't, right? Because copyright stands in the way and other intellectual property barriers stand in the way. And so whenever you're delivering these digital scholarly objects, you need to make sure that they're um, permissioned or open licensed so that other people can actually go ahead and use them. Okay, I'll come back to, I'll come back to all these points. They float through the entire, court, uh, the entire talk. Okay, so if, you, if I asked each of you what um, reproducibility would mean in your work, I think I would get some quite different answers. And um, one of the things in discussions around reproducibility that you might have run into here already is when people have a different idea of what the concept means that you're discussing, it's very difficult to sort of move to a standard or a resolution. Um, so one of the things that I have found useful is to try and pull out pieces of what reproducibility actually means. And um, because each of these pieces has very different remedies associated with it. <clears throat> so the first, the first type of reproducibility that I've identified, and maybe you can come up with others or sort of criticize, uh, you know, uh, my three, but, the, but these are the ones that, that I've found useful. So the first one is um, empirical reproducibility. There is a lot of press um, and attention being given um, internationally um, on, all over the US that I'm aware of um, to irreproducibility issues in the life sciences. And this is a huge concern to people, of course, because you know people want to know that the drugs they're taking work and we're properly researched and so on. So it really hits the popular um, media because that's something people can really understand. And so I've, I've pulled those out as empirical reproducibility in the sense that can I go to say, your, or like a similar um, wet lab bench, say for example in biology, and can I carry out physically the same experiment that you actually carried out? And so in a sense it's empirical, you're sort of doing things in sort of an, uh, sort of an empirical way, and it's the same idea of reproducibility that we've had through the sciences um, all the way through. So I think actually in those discussions we don't actually have anything new that we're talking about. Um, we're really thinking about why did the existing system that's been around for hundreds of years break on those um, studies that were done in an empirical way. So I don't focus my research so much on empirical reproducibility, but this is probably 80% of the sort of hype that you hear around reproducibility. Um, another uh, way of thinking about reproducibility that um, and I have some examples of all of these coming up that I find useful is thinking about statistical reproducibility. So things like um, experimental design or power or how you might expect your statistical conclusions to generalize to a new sample. Um, so that's of course very different to say someone carrying out a biology experiment at the bench. And then the last one where I really do focus a lot of my research is computational reproducibility. So how do those technological changes that I just outlined a few minutes ago impact the type of research that, um, how we carry it out, how we disseminate, what our standards are, and so on. So um, if people have these sort of different notions in mind when they're talking, we end up with a very confused conversation. So I found that those to be fairly useful. So here's an example of empirical reproducibility. There was an, a short article published in Cell Reports called Sorting Out the Facts. So what happened in this article, okay, I don't think I put the year on there, I think it's 2013, I think. Um, uh, so what happened in, in this group, this was a well-funded collaboration between Harvard and Berkeley, and these are two top labs who do um, biological research. They, they um, process cells to understand um, how cancer is advancing in the cells, particularly breast cancer cells. 
And in their, um, the grant that they got from the National Institutes for Health for this collaboration, they specified that what they would do is spend two months at the beginning of the grant and make sure that each lab, uh, you know, the Harvard lab and the Berkeley lab, were producing identical cell outputs that were indistinguishable so that they sort of had a baseline for their research and there was no sort of signature associated with the lab where the, the cells were processed. It took them two years to try and um, get it to the point where the processes in the two labs were actually um, close enough that you couldn't tell which lab the, um, the output had come from. And they were shocked, so enough so that they actually um, wrote this article saying, you know, this type of reproducibility is much harder than what you think, and actually we're probably introducing all sorts of error into our research unwittingly because we think the output from the labs are the same, but really they're actually quite different. And uh, the part that I highlighted there that I think it's impossible for you to read, I, um, I, that was when they, um, when they figured out what the actual issue was, one lab uh, took their sort of cell slurry and stirred it in a beaker. The other lab put that beaker in a centrifuge. You know, and two years to try and actually unpack the process enough to try and understand what those differences were. Um, another example that I just like to throw up because uh, the different um, types of reproducibility have quite different problems associated with them. So there was a workshop about a year and a half ago, reproducibility issues in research with animals and animal models. So we have already in this discussion yesterday and today always taken reproducibility as a good thing. And if reproducibility means um, carrying out an experiment for a second time that means you're going to be killing animals, suddenly you have sort of costs and benefits involved in reproducibility. It's not necessarily always good to be uh, reproducing an experiment. So those are the types of issues that come up in empirical reproducibility. Okay, statistical reproducibility, again, I won't spend too much time on it, but just to give you an idea. So using, for example, hypothesis testing and the um, entire machinery of p-values uh, to actually discover your hypothesis instead of test your hypothesis. I'm sure people who work in that domain are quite familiar with this idea of p-hacking and sort of looking through the data until you get something that sort of matches your preconceptions of what the results should look like. Um, designing low power experiments, non-random sampling, for example, all of these things stopping your results from generalizing. How have you treated outliers, especially when you're combining data sets? What are you reporting? So this goes right to the heart of reproducibility. I can't understand exactly how you've extracted that information from the data, like what types of methods you've used. If I don't even know how you've treated outliers or what your thresholds were, or what kind of data pre-processing you've done. And uh, very rarely is that information ever really included in the paper, right? And, and of course, as you all know, small changes in how you treat outliers can dramatically change the results, right? They can be quite sensitive. Um, all the sort of regular problems poor model design, um, the specification, um, very sensitive models or parameter, uh, very sensitive models and, and output for um, small changes in the parameter, for parameter settings, for example, that go into the model. So all of these things make it, make the results more fragile and less likely to actually replicate. So a whole different set of questions to say what the Berkeley Harvard labs were looking at when they were trying to deal with their centrifuge. Okay, and then what I'm going to spend um, most of my time on is the notion of computational and reproducibility. So this one is new. Uh, over the last, at the most, 20 years, maybe 15 years, we've really started to embed um, computation as the normal way that we carry out research. Uh, I would say, I don't know, rough guess, upwards of 85% of all the scientific output uses computation somewhere, maybe upwards of 90%. It's just very difficult to... Um, published work that is either wholly theoretical or doesn't somehow use um, at least some computational aspects in deriving the results. Okay, so we've, the way I like to think about it is we've traditionally had two branches of the scientific method. We, so we started with the deductive branch, including mathematics, logic, and, uh, and sort of reasoning that, that could be deduced from axioms. And then this was expanded to the empirical branch or inductive branch, 
uh, that started to include uh, statistical analysis of controlled experiments. So deductive logic, Pythagorean theorem and so on, didn't help you when you wanted to try to understand where to plant, how close to the Nile to plant your crops so they wouldn't get flooded but they were still in the floodplain and so on, and you had to start to do these um, predictions. There's a lot of talk about how these technological changes I outlined at the beginning are creating new branches of the scientific method. So you've probably heard a third branch of the scientific method. We can um, carry out high-powered simulations and extract knowledge, ask new scientific questions within the context of a simulation and simulating an entire physical system, for example, changing the parameters, simulating again and trying to understand um, our world through those means that are wholly computational. So that often gets labeled as you know, sort of third branch of the scientific method. Um, fourth branch of the scientific method is data-driven discovery. So people think that we can really um, take these enormous amounts of data that are everywhere landing in our lap. It's almost embarrassing how much data we have as researchers and, uh, and ask new questions, develop new types of methods, and um, really get results that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And so people start to say, well, that's also a fourth branch of the scientific method. In fact, we've you know, doubled the number of branches. So the main thesis th that I'm going to present to you today is that these third and fourth branches, so I put a little question mark in there that you probably noticed, how computation prevents, presents only a potential third or fourth branch of the scientific method. So what we need to do is all that hard work about um, uh, standards for dissemination to really bring them up to third and fourth branches of the scientific method. So, whoops. Um, so that, I'll explain that a little bit more. So if we think about why we have a scientific method that guides our research, um, the reason we do is we have um, all of our processes are fraught with error. And when we discover something, the first question is, well, do we know it's right? How confident are we in this? Um, I present it to the community. Of course, there's no gold standard. I can answers in the back of the book where I can check. Um, the, all I can do is present it to the community and try and convince my peers that really this is actually something that we should um, attach a very high probability of being true to. And so in the deductive branch, we didn't just sort of present Pythagorean theorem. It traveled with its proof. Right, so other people could actually go through and verify why we should believe that or, or use it. In the empirical branch, there's an entire machinery of hypothesis testing that's established. You use appropriate statistical methods, and then there's a very structured way that you communicate the results. If you try to um, publish a paper and just sort of leave the methods section blank, of course they won't publish that. So we need comparable standards. Whatever the, it means to have a proof in computational science, whatever that same sort of dissemination standards and protocols are in computational science, in my opinion, that's what we need to develop before we can really start calling simulation and data-driven discovery and so on third and fourth branches of the scientific method. Okay, so this quote um, actually gets... Um, mentioned quite a bit when people talk about reproducibility, and I like it, so I'll, I'll go ahead and mention it. Um, so my advisor actually was David Donahoe that you can see in the middle of the slide there. Um, he was inspired by John Clairbout, who was a geophysics professor, I believe he's emeritus now, at Stanford, who in 1992, um, he actually started refusing to sign a student's thesis unless he could reproduce it in the computational sense. So run, basically they would give them a make file and they, it, would, it would chunk through and then eventually generate the thesis, including all the figures and so on. And unless he was able to reproduce the thesis on his system, he wouldn't sign it and the student wouldn't graduate. So he was very heavy-handed about it. Um, on the other hand, he really developed a lot of the core notions around reproducible research that we rely on today. And I think it's very interesting that Claire Bount didn't talk about integrity or fourth branch of the scientific method or any of this stuff. He actually talked about one of the reasons that was mentioned yesterday, which is he had new students coming into his lab and it would take them about two years to produce new original results because they had to spend so much time rewriting code or trying to understand what previous students had done before they could really contribute in a novel way. 
um, when he started refusing to sign the thesis unless it was reproducible on his system, that went to two weeks. So students could get there, immediately rerun um, work that had been done previously and start extending it uh, sort of almost trivially and contribute new results. So that was his motivation and it was very practical. Um, so Donahoe su summarizes these ideas of really reproducible research, that's the term that Claire Bout used, by saying the idea is that an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, and of course we all, it's what we're rewarded for, we all get fixated on that um, publication, it's merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete set of instructions and data that generated the figures. Okay, so one question that I often get at this point that I'll just mention is people, um, they tease out two different ways to interpret reproducibility in the computational context, and they're, they're exactly right. So one that I just mentioned in the thesis example, can I actually just run your scripts, run your code, using your data, using the same input parameters and same settings, and can I get figure four, or whatever it is that you're, you're putting in your paper, or your tables, can I get the same results? And um, people will say, but who cares, really? That's not, that's not a waste of time. You can't even, you're not extending scientific knowledge by that way. All you're doing is sort of verifying a computational system. And that's true. So they say, well, what would be really interesting is suppose I took your results from figure four, and I sort of understood in an abstract way what you had done, to get them, and then I recoded it all, and I started from new data, new collections, and I independently um, tried to generate the figures that are in your paper. And then if I get the same thing, then this is a real scientific contribution, and it's very interesting, and so on. And I think that's true, and, and that's right. And I'm not arguing that running someone else's code um, and, and making sure you can get their results, or even your own coding, and re-getting your own results, um, is a new scientific contribution. However, I can guarantee you, if you go through and you code up someone else's work um, and you try to get the same results, even if you fully understood what they've done, I guarantee you, you won't get exactly the same results. It's just the pipeline is just too complex these days. The systems, there's too much that we can't control on them. And you will get something a little bit different. So then the question is, is that different, re is that different it's real? Like, are you actually providing counter evidence for the findings that were published? Or is that difference just noise that's in that discovery pipeline and that we should ignore and essentially you've come up with the same results? And the only way we're going to understand how to reconcile those differences, whether they're real or, or, or apparent, is if we can actually run through the scripts and generate those results in that sort of less exciting way. So I think we really need both. We need to be able to have that level of transparency that allows us to do that diff between the different um, methods that actually produce the result. But of course, that doesn't mean that the results are correct. Right? We can reproduce terrible wrong results all day. And it doesn't mean that they're actually right. But that independent um, reproduction and being able to understand how those two approaches differed, then that's something that we can really start to say, OK, so that corroborates our results, that's counter evidence, and then we can really start to have that, that discussion. Okay, so norms. Um, I think it's useful to think, in thinking about this to think about why we have reproducibility or where it came from and in the responses what's appropriate. There's an enormous number of responses that can be taken when trying to make your work reproducible uh, with varying degrees of work that falls on the researcher too. So uh, we all have a bias maybe as to which ones we might prefer. Um, but so thinking about the norms can help kind of parse out what's important and what's not or what's idealistic and what's important for us to actually do. So the two that I focus on here, so, so Merton in, in 1942 came up with these five norms of scientific research. They are not uncontroversial, even though I'm setting them up here as if they are uncontroversial, but uh, I have found them helpful in guiding my thinking around these issues. So communalism, scientific results are the common property of the community. Uh, universalism, all scientists can contribute to science regardless of race, nationality, culture, gender, and so on. Um, disinterestedness, as researchers were acting for the benefit of a common scientific enterprise rather than for our own personal gain. Originality, so new scientific claims will contribute something new in order to get the attention of the community. 
and skepticism, so scientific claims must be exposed to critical scrutiny before being accepted. So this is, um, the two that I rely on are probably um, skepticism and a little bit um, communalism here. But the research that we're doing changes in ways beyond what I'm going to cut, beyond the scope of this talk. It changes, it's changing in ways where we have far increased um, interactions with industry and collaborations, and we are thinking about new funding models, for example, um, at um, sort of the government level and how we actually produce the research. And I have found those norms useful to sort of bear in mind about what we're about and what we're doing when we start crafting these sort of new ways of carrying out our research, getting it funded. Um, uh, it, it's very easy to um, sort of uh, slide away from things like scientific results being the common property of the community, for example, when you start dealing with people who aren't scientists. Okay, so skepticism, the last one there, um, I'll just mention a historical note so we can independently verify the claim. So this is what, this is the one that I think really drives a lot of our um, uh, need for transparency, why it's an issue and what's going on behind reproducibility. So this is Robert Boyle. He initiated this idea in the 1660s, actually with the advent of the first journal of the Royal Society. Um, he wanted to be able to reproduce experiments without having to write a letter to the author or some of the original paper or somehow have the author involved. So that's where we get this idea that you shouldn't have to email the author if you want to understand their work. It should be, in theory, contained in the paper, according to Boyle. So then the question is, he of course wasn't dealing with computational methods, he was dealing with sort of air pumps and sort of vacuums and what I, what I was calling empirical um, research. So how do we take that notion that worked for the empirical setting and apply it to the setting where we have deeply computational research? Okay, so here's the part everybody has been waiting for. Okay, best practice principles. And now it's too built up because it's just not that, it's not gonna solve all the problems. But, but it's sort of like the norms that maybe there's um, things here that can guide decisions. Okay, so I actually have a paper called Best Practices for Computational Science. So I dug it out and put this up there. So software infrastructure and environments for reproducible and extensive research. Extensible research. Um, this is from 2013, so already it's three years old. Already the ideas here, um, I would probably write a little bit different paper today. Things move so rapidly around this, uh, this area. But what I did in this article is um, I traced through a history of um, some of the discussions that have been happening in the community and then tried to come up with some guiding ideas uh, for best practices for researchers. One of the things that I was alluding to at the beginning is the type of research that you're actually doing has very different prescriptions around reproducibility. Um, okay, so in the computational context, um, so I actually did this um, sort of Yale roundtable in 2009 that you can see the sort of bluish writing up there, reproducible research, addressing the need for data and code sharing and computational science. So that was, I think, one of the first gatherings that said, um, that brought researchers, stakeholders, funding agency folks together and said, we've, we've got a problem in terms of the transparency of computational work, but what are we gonna do? And um, we came up with that document that we published saying, you know, here's, some ideas that people can think about using in their work that I'll get to in a little bit. And then we had the next section, which were the dreams, things we would really like to see, like tools or support or changes in how, how we saw funding happening and so on. Um, in 20, at the end of 2012, so Brown University does the, these week-long um, workshops and you just sort of apply for one called ISERM. And uh, we produce a report there. So the ISERM discussion was much bigger um, people were extremely interested in it and were very agitated and lively and these are people across different disciplines who didn't necessarily know each other, they're coming together around reproducibility. And then we had a workshop report there which is much more comprehensive and if you're interested I'm happy to send links and so on and it has some of these definitions and levels of reproducibility and it's, it's one stab at the problem. Um, uh, you may read it and say, well, this, this part doesn't apply to my work, that part does, and I would change that part a little bit, and, and that's, uh, that's what we intended. I mean, that's fine. But setting the default, default to reproducible in um, computational research, so our idea was instead of 
sort of saying, well, I can't do it for this reason, my data has privacy issues, can't do this, can't do it. Make everything open, transparent, reproducible, and then deal with the exceptions. Okay, so you have an exception because you have, say, human subjects in your data, so clearly you're not going to be putting your data on the web. But everybody else who doesn't sort of have that exception, then they go forward and, and try and make their work more transparent. Um, I put this one here too, so Exceed is a tool that I, I think I heard it mentioned actually yesterday that some people use. Um, it's an interface between um, uh, high-end, high-performance computing resources and researchers to try and give them the sort of software inter interface to access it, access the sort of big, powerful machines. And they have an annual um, gathering, and we did a workshop, um, reproducibility, it's a little bit blurry, and again, we came up with a workshop report, and the notion was if that's, if Exceed is creating a software middle layer that's um, assisting access to these computational resources, maybe that software is really the right place to start building in some of the things like capturing what um, functions were submitted in what order, with what parameter settings, that could all be automated. Right? And so I think it's interesting because one of the arguments also mentioned yesterday um, against reproducibility is the underlying hardware, this is a computational system, can change. So even if I have, say, your scripts, even if they've been uh, bundled in a virtual machine as much as possible, actually running them on a different system is a whole different kettle of fish and painful and not clear that necessarily uh, a valuable use of, of a researcher's time. Um, but it's very interesting because it's the high performance computing community in my opinion, is really making the greatest strides to do this, and they probably have the hardest challenge because they really do have some unique pieces of hardware, like a supercomputer, there's just one, right? That you're not gonna, and the software is so customized for that particular um, piece of technology, so that's a sort of very challenging case in reproducibility, yet they're taking it on. So for example, um, in supercomputing, they have an annual, um, huge annual conference called Supercomputing, although they've just changed the name to SC. And um, there's a student competition every year. So in the discussion in the steering community for this supercomputing workshop um, or conference, they started thinking about, well, what can our requirements be around reproducibility? Exactly the same questions that you all have been asking yourself. And they, realized, they ran into the same issue. They didn't know exactly what they should be requiring of researchers. And it's a competitive issue. I mean. It, people really want to publish in this conference and uh, be part of the proceedings, so it has to be fair. They can't sort of arbitrarily ask for incredibly difficult things. They don't want it to either be, be a joke either. Um, and so the, the approach that they took is, well, since we don't know the answer, and this is really high impact on people's careers, what we will do is we'll run, um, as part of our student cluster competition, a reproducibility um, study. So uh, the student cluster competition happens every year. And so this year, for the first time, they've actually chosen a paper that the students will actually replicate. And that becomes their sort of learning opportunity for what worked, what didn't work, what was hard, what did the students need, and there, that's where they're going to start building their standards for the requirements for the conference proceedings themselves. So that's one approach, and, um, and very interesting, and they're just doing it for the first time this year, so you have to stay tuned on that one. These, these things are... They just take time. Okay, so this is a wall of text, but I'll summarize it for you. But what I, what I wanted to do was pull out, um, this is, a two thousand, uh, this is um, text from a 2003 report, just to let you know how long these issues have been um, on the forefront of some people's minds and discussed. So that's, um, we're gonna be close to 20 years of discussion on the topic uh, in about five. Um, so this is National Academy of Sciences. The publication is called Sharing Publication-Related Data and Materials, Responsibility of Authorship in the Life Sciences. So they were focused on the life sciences. However, I think what they're saying does generalize. So here are their principles from that report. Um, principle one, authors should include in their publications data, algorithms, other information that's central or integral to the publication, that is, whatever is necessary to support the major claims of the paper that would enable one skilled in the art to verify and um, replicate the claims. So you'd think that was, I just wrote that this morning, right? But that's actually 2003. I didn't write that, but that's 2003. Um, and coming from the life sciences as well. And you can see how they're quite sensitive to the computational aspects of talking about algorithms. In many of the discussions that I've seen around 
reproducibility in the empirical sciences, you almost never see code mentioned. They might talk about data sharing at the most, but they have somehow uh, skip over code. So I'm, I, I was very happy to see algorithms mentioned in there. Okay, in exchange for credit and acknowledgement that comes with publishing in a peer-reviewed journal, authors are expected to provide the information essential to their published findings. We don't have those standards today, still. However, a number of journals are really moving towards those requirements um, and rapidly moving towards it. Okay, so principle two, if central or integral information can't be included in the publication for practical reasons, large data sets, human subjects, there are sort of real reasons. Um, it should be made um, freely and readily accessible through other means. Well, okay, you can see it's 2003 when they say, for example, online. Um, when necessary to enable further research, integral information should be made available in a form that enables it to be manipulated, analyzed, and combined with other scientific data. So they're already layering additional work on people. So I sort of haven't mentioned that issue that I've just sort of said data and code, but um, again, that's very abstract. And when you actually think about sharing your data or your code, things like formats, interoperability, what kind of metadata standards do you need? <coughs> do you wanna make this something that's machine readable or discoverable? Where do you actually share this? Um, all these issues start to kind of float up to the surface. Uh, principle three. If publicly accessible repositories for data have been agreed on by a community of researchers, and there are many communities where this is really the case, um, and are in general use, the relevant data should be deposited in one of these repositories. So we have domain-specific repositories, um, many of them around, say, the Life Sciences Genomics funded by NIH, other repositories that have just sort of um, either started as an institution, a, a repository as a particular institution, and then kind of become the standard for the domain. Uh, those uh, are something that came organically from the scientific community. We don't have any such similar thing for code in the sense that it's come organically from the community. All these repositories will tell you that they'll accept code, but what they're talking about is um, sort of a bundle of bits, like a zip file, that um, sits there static like a data set. So they're sort of imagining code as a data set which is very unsatisfying. Something more like you know, GitHub or Bitbucket is much more how people want to share and deal with code. Um, GitHub and Bitbucket aren't from the scientific community. They're, you know, GitHub's a commercial enterprise and so on, the closed source platform. And it's largely becoming the standard now for how scientific codes get shared. Um, but when we think back to Merton's norms and we think about that engagement with people who have different sets of incentives than we do, um, I don't have better options at this point. I think GitHub's great, but, um, but they're not organic from our community the way some of these data repositories were and people knew about them in 2003. So it's just something to think about. I mean, you also think about, um, we sort of have kind of cycles in code, code um, sharing platforms that people probably remember SourceForge, right? 10 years ago, gone essentially, no one uses it. And then people used, um, code.google.com quite a bit, sort of moved their code over from SourceForge. Now people have moved on to GitHub. They'll move somewhere else. Um, it's about a five-year cycle. And, uh, and so the, the permanency of these objects is something to think about as well. Um, the idea that you could read a paper that's five years old and still be able to reproduce the results seems desirable. All right, it's not easy. Try a paper that's 10 years old. And I'm leaving aside the issue of actually running the code, which is, you know, 10 year old code is probably not ever going to run. However, it still can be useful to look at what the parameter settings were, how they implemented the algorithms, and what the, um, um, what the decisions were. Okay, so here's the best practices that I came up with in the paper. Um, the first one um, open licensing for data and code, sort of the software aspects that travel with the um, object and for the data. So you pre-permission these objects, and I can talk about more about this if, if you're interested, um, so that people can legally just click, download, use. Um, I would put citation recommendations with anything that I shared, so hopefully people go ahead and cite, however you prefer them to actually cite the data and the code. Um, workflow tracking. Um, I think it's very difficult to produce reproducible research if it's something you decide to do after you've written the paper. You really need to sort of start at the beginning of the research process and take those pieces of information as you're going through that you think you're going to sh need to share at the end. 
Um, so having that, um, that additional piece of information that tells people what order to run your functions in, what parameter settings there were, all those little pieces of information they need to actually run and uh, produce the final results. Data available and accessible. Version control for data. People generally don't think about this one. I think it's very important. If you think about the published claim as sort of the primary object that you're sharing and the code and the data supporting that claim, I mean, this is really our, the notion of reproducibility I've been building. Um, if you have a data set that kind of got fixed or updated between publication and when a user reads it, I mean, you've broken reproducibility, right? And so people find that counterintuitive. Well, yeah, but there's mistakes in the data set. Of course, I want to fix, fix the data. On the other hand, you know, the way we think about results in the scholarly record is they are, you know, fixed in the scholarly record. So mistakes and all, I mean, code is always buggy, right? all these mistakes. We need to have that full snapshot and persist. You want to change the data set or the code and so on. The way we normally do it is you sort of do that as a separate entry into the, into the scholarly record. But many, um, many times I've run into people who um, run repositories or so on or, or, or data managers who are wonderful at their jobs, but, um, but there's a difference between um, sort of make, ensuring that work can be reproduced from a particular data set and sort of that ongoing revision of data sets. So GitHub has um, a file size limit of two gigs. It's not appropriate for data. And we don't have sort of, I mean, people are sort of working at it and nibbling at the problem, but we don't have sort of an organized version control system for data. And it seems pretty clear we wouldn't want to recopy the data sets every time we make a small change, right? So we need some more intelligent system. Um, making the raw data available. So in some discussions, people like to make the processed data available with the uh, scripts that they um, use to generate the figures. However, as I mentioned at the beginning, that sort of goes back to the statistical reproducibility issues. What did you do with your outliers? What did you do when you process the data? That can be really important. So I would say making the raw data available. Again, you run into size issues, you run into all sorts of, but in, in the ideal, in the abstract, making the raw data available and having those processing scripts available as well so people can see um, all the decisions that were made. Um, and data types, data of course is so different. Tiny little files that are just running toy examples um, up to very large streaming or dynamic databases. So how, how this happens, um, again, a system that works perfectly for, you know, small data sets just immediately breaks for larger data sets. And um, it, it, I don't have a silver bullet answer on this. Um, it just it, it makes the problem more interesting and more fun. Um, code, code and methods being available and accessible. So version control for code, we have a huge amount of work that's been done on that. Uh, making the code available externally. I personally believe that the time for exposure and transparency is at the point of publication. So when um, a researcher decides uh, these results are ready, I have confidence in them, I'm going to bring them out to the community. At that point, that's when all these sort of additional aspects flow with the results, data, code, workflow information, and so on. Um, some researchers don't agree with me. They think that um, we should be exposing our research as we're going through. And uh, they cite things like, well, what about negative results and dead ends and p-hacking and so on? I should have this sort of more elaborate trail of the research that was actually done. Um, I, it's not a right answer on this. I just feel like when the research is under um, deliberation and consideration, in a sense, it's sort of a very creative, private kind of way that you're interacting with the research. And then at that point of publication is where you're saying to the community that, that I've got this to a level that I, I'm confident sharing it all. Um, version control for environments. So for example, um, Docker and some of the virtual machines and containers were mentioned yesterday. So um, ensuring that these are shareable. Code samples and, um, well, I put test data there, but what I'm talking about is actually thinking about testing in the context of um, software and code for science. Uh, if you are um, coming from the open source software community, when you contribute code, to a project, you would never just contribute, you know, the actual ex executable statements. You would also contribute um, uh, tests, so people know when the code is running correctly and when it's not. So unit tests, some pieces of the code, regression tests, and so on. We don't 
think about that much in, um, when, as scientists sharing our software. Uh, we, there is sort of an implicit test when we share, can we produce figure four or whatever it is. But thinking about what it means to understand when code is running correctly and when it's not, I think is a new area for us to think about. Um, maybe I, what happens if I throw in an appropriately sized matrix of zeros, maybe I get some predictable result and we can start sort of thinking about tests that should travel with the software. It's not always going to be possible to get the software to, um, to do inspect what's actually in the software. At some point, we're going to actually, I think, need to rely on tests to really understand the software. We certainly have to for proprietary codes that are used in research that are closed. Um, what, to do, what to do with the big code bases is an interesting problem, especially ones that have been around 20 years already. How do we start kind of exposing and open sourcing some of those, um, some of those code bases? Um, citation, third-party data software should be cited. Cite your own in your paper. Cite your own code that you use for that paper. Cite your own data. Get the, get the ball rolling, set an example. Um, and then, of course, uh, it almost goes without saying that if there are requirements that you're subject to, like in your department, for example, or your, your funder, the sort of person who's giving you grant money of some sort to do the research has requirements, um, obviously you're going to comply with those. Um, they're never going to be, well, I don't, I don't want to say never. In the next 10 to 15 years, they won't be as strict as this anyway. So you almost implicitly get that for free. Okay. Um, all right, so we're almost done. The last thing that I wanted to show you is, um, by the way, the slides are on my website and I'll make sure that they're linked because all of these tools and these efforts and so on are hot linked on there and I think they're kind of cool to play with. Um, so this is, this is stuff, almost all of these are just researchers who recognized the problem and decided to start solving it themselves and on their own time built a tool. The one that I especially wanted to mention was iPoll as an example. Let's see if this... Okay, so um, I'll just briefly go through this, and, but I'll let you um, uh, play with it um, on your own. But what they did, so this is um, actually an open source platform. So they have their code in GitHub and you can just spin up your own kind of iPaul looking thing as you want. And they, the, the approach, so iPaul stands for image processing online. And the approach that they took was to create a new journal and have this reviewed and then this article appears organically in this online journal. It's a whole other question I can talk about whether to start a new journal or try and change existing journals. I think it's better to stick with the existing journals, but, um, but they, they did it um, in such a way that they um, organically do this. So let me just choose a paper here. And you can see what they've done. They've said, here's the article. And by the way, full text, manuscript, PDFs, everything traditional is here. Um, article and then source code you can see down here. So image processing is sort of very lucky in a sense that generally they deal with images or maybe about a couple gigs at the most. And uh, so, the, and then most of their, the impact is in the actual algorithm that they've developed, so in the source code. So they have the source code here. And um, so you can grab the pieces that go with this. Notice they have demo, and then they have archive here. So demo, um, you can take images from the paper. I don't know what cabin, okay. And then go ahead and run it, right? So they've implemented their algorithm organically in the journal. And the really cool thing, so you can just check the results, like you don't have to actually install all their code. And the cool thing is you can upload your own data here. So why believe them on their handcrafted chosen images? Put your own in and try it out. So that's what's in archive. So last time I clicked on archive, you don't know, this is just random people, I don't know what I'm gonna get here. Uploading their image, okay. So once I got something a little weird with um, a student <laughs> and it was not a good situation. Um, so, but it's interesting, you can see, this is what people are just playing with it and running it and so on and trying out the algorithm and so on. And so that's, it's one approach. I mean, you asked for some examples. It's one example that this community, this sort of group of researchers, not even a community, has taken in, in developing their journal. Okay, um, there we go. I will not go through an approach that I came up with, a research compendia, trying to link data and code to journals. I wanted to mention this article very briefly because of the conversation yesterday, co-chairing associated with research impact in um, image processing. People have done some research on this and there is a, a bump that you get for co-chairing. Um, I would assume it's the same for data sharing. Uh, you might say, well, there's confounding factors. Maybe the best researchers are more likely to share their code. Sure, but okay, you still are getting that impact factor. 
Um, and then I wanted to leave you, this is my last slide, and I wanted to leave you with a few questions about uh, what I talked about at the beginning about thinking about this world of radical transparency. So we query the scholarly record now because we are looking for a particular paper or we're looking for an author or maybe we can query by keywords. That's about the extent of it. Right? And the t one of the talks yesterday um, started sort of pushing on these issues. Well, what can I do if I want to do kind of more intelligent queries of the scholarly records? For example, show me a table of effect sizes and p-values in all phase three clinical trials from melanoma published after 1994. It's basically impossible to do that query today. It's kind of an obvious query to want to do, though. Name all the image denoising algorithms ever used to remove white noise from the famous Barber image with citations. So actually, I don't know if you noticed, I went over it really quickly, but in that random um, IPOL paper that I chose, Barbara was in there. So presumably, you, we would pull that paper as well as whatever else. Impossible. But I would want to know, right? How, what's, what's happened around Barbara? Who's manipulated what for her? Uh, list all the classifiers applied to the famous acute lymphoblastic leukemia data set along with their type 1 and type 2 errors. So with a student, we actually tried to do that manually just to see how, how uh, hard it is of what kind of papers we could come up with. We found about um, uh, 13 papers and something like about a little over 20 classifiers, but uh, it was by hand. It's not a query I can actually do. I'd like to do that if I want to apply a particular um, Classifier to the data set, I'd like to know that I'm not duplicating someone's work, and it's hard to um, figure that out. Create a unified data set containing all the published whole genome sequences identified with the mutation in the gene BRCA1. So come up with your breast cancer um, data set. It's hard to generate that. You have to kind of go to the sources and start piecing the data together. These are all kind of obvious for scientific query, though. Randomly reassign treatment and control labels to cases in um, some particular published clinical trial. Calculate effect size. Repeat many times. Create a histogram of these effect sizes. Do it for every clinical trial published in the year 2003, say. Listing trial and histogram side by side. So are the effects real or not real in these um, clinical trials? Very difficult to, to do these queries. So I leave it there as my last slide to sort of spurn thinking about where we can actually take this and, um, and how core this is to the types of things that we're doing as a scientist and the way that we're disseminating our knowledge. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Hello. Um, I had read about uh, b hacking before and reproducibility problems in statistical science. And one of the things that came up was people discussing the possible inadequacy of p values and yeah. difficulty of understanding them. Is there any sort of uh, alternative method pushed? Uh, That's a very good question. So uh, I, I know some of those discussions, and they tend to come from the psychology community. Um, uh, where there has been a lot of discussion. Actually, the term p-hacking was coined by Yuri Simonson, who is a psychologist, um, or professor of psychology. Uh, the approach they've taken is actually not in your question where you say alternative methods. So the approach that some journals are starting to take, I think I know one that's doing it, is they're saying we're not going to publish p-values anymore, um, just don't talk about it, which seems to me worse. Right? That at least with something with p-values, I, I can sort of structure and try to understand it. Um, but without that, uh, you know, I don't. I, I think we're just, you know, you're just going to be publishing uh, into unintelligible junk, is what I think. Um, other journals, what I've heard the discussion is, well, we'll publish confidence intervals, we won't publish p-values, but of course they're dual. So that doesn't actually do anything different. And it just, it does highlight what you're saying about the difficulty in understanding p-values, because clearly they didn't really understand what is going on in the determination of a p-value. Um, th that's the level of the discussion that I've seen. Um, I, I, the way that I like to think of it as a statistician is it's a call for more statisticians and more statistical research so that we can actually adapt p-values um, to the modern context. There is, of course, a lot of work going on with multiple comparisons. Um, Benjamini has been doing work with false discovery rate, for example. Those are much more intelligent and structured approaches to how to deal with the, the p-hacking problem. But the, the sort of main problem 
that isn't being addressed is this idea of carrying out test after test after test after test and then reporting the one that happened to give you the results you want. I mean, that's almost a social problem, not really a statistics problem, or maybe a tools problem. Okay, that's you. a great question. Thank you. Um, I have a question. What should be done if, uh, for some reasons, you are not allowed to share the data either? For example, with Twitter, you only can share the IDs of the tweets, and once you try to retrieve it, you will never get the same as, as the original research has had, or you have some privacy issues. So what is the workaround then? There's, um, there's work that's being done on that. That's a great question with a very difficult answer. So it depends on why you can't share the data. So, um, for example, human subjects data, obviously there's laws. You're not going to sort of put people's medical records out on the web. <laughs> you probably end up in jail. Um, on the other hand, people are starting to do things like be more sensitive to issues around reproducibility. So um, prior to the recent discussion, if you had any kind of identifiable personal information in the data sets, you just zero. Like you just don't share it and it, it either gets destroyed or probably just gets destroyed. Um, now I think there's a lot more research that's coming up as well, can we do something that shares some of it and still protects confidentiality and some very sophisticated research around, um, actually it was mentioned a little bit yesterday, differential privacy sometimes helps. Um, can we query the data set in such a way that I don't learn the characteristics of the people in the data set, but I can even maybe with some noise, I can get some confidence in the results that someone derived who did have access to the data set. So maybe there are sort of sophisticated ways we can do this. Maybe we can be more clever about authorizing other researchers into sort of a pool that has access and what the controls are and make that more seamless. We're also talking about um, uh, sort of cultural issues too as people, um, like quantified self-movement, people have a lot more sense of ownership over their own data for their own bodies and they'll say things like, actually I want you to share my data with other clinical trials and so on. I don't want you to ask my permission every single time. And right now, we don't really have a mechanism to facilitate that. We just sort of have this machinery that says no, that you, it's bad for you. We, we can't actually, all the linking that was talked about yesterday, we can actually not guarantee your privacy. Well, I don't care about my privacy. Well, no, we're not. So I think we'll see this cultural evolution as well as we become sort of more comfortable with people who want to actually um, share the data. Um, so that's just in, in privacy. Um, other places I have also optimism. So for example, um, if you work with Google, Facebook, sort of flashy types of um, companies to collaborate with, uh, you're, you're, there's no way you're sharing the data that, that that's based on, right? In fact, if you're working with Facebook, you've got the Facebook laptop with their stack on it. And in fact, you're probably now, I think, even actually at Facebook. So you're doing your fellowship there. And um, I think there's a real culture clash that we have to reconcile between transparency in, in the research that we're demanding as computational scientists and those types of collaborations where data's not available, methods really are not available, and how they're instantiated, you might get a high level description. But, um, but if you want, I think if you want to contribute to the scientific community in the discussion, you've got to be making all of this available. How do I know? <clears throat> what exactly you did and why it's right. So those are also cultural issues I think we can sort of start to push on. Um, we have some leverage as scientists. We don't need to necessarily sign all the NDAs uh, right off. I'm not saying necessarily with Facebook and Google are probably the hardest cases. But if we think cleverly about how we engage with um, uh, pe people who are very important to science but maybe aren't scientists, then we can start to sort of plan these things out from the beginning better. So, there's, so, there's, so it's a very complicated answer to what seems like a straightforward question. It really depends on what the barriers are. And you see it with codes too. People who develop codes in a collaboration and then say the company wants to use the code and doesn't want it sort of shared openly because they don't want to advantage their competitors. And how do we start negotiating and navigating all these sort of new um, interactions that are coming up that 20 years ago we barely had to think about these things. Thank you for a great talk. Oh, um, I don't know about the US regulations, but uh, I know roughly about European uh, law. And um, talking about data protection and talking about data sets that contain faces and voice, speech. Um, are there any practices of uh, um, letting third parties, uh, I mean, um, like 
having contracts for third parties to be able to use the, these data for scientific purposes only. And um, how can you control and track all those people, third parties that you are just, I mean, you are given some permission to use this data by participants. But it's not your data and you're trying to give it to the community. So how is this going on That's in the US? That's a great question. So I think um, sort of the legal issues that attend to this discussion are completely under-researched and underpowered. So if people are interested in them, I think you could make a career easily on, on these issues. Um, so I don't know of any canonical examples of con uh, contracts that could say, for example, service templates or, or guides, uh, but that's an opportunity to start kind of maybe thinking about them and, and developing them. Um, I am involved in a project which is, it's based in the US, so it has more sort of US law around it and less European law, and that's actually why I didn't go into the legal research that I do. It's so US based, it's, and privacy is quite different here, and copyright is quite different. Um, but this, so what's going on in this project that I'm involved in is it is state governments in the US, so say New York State or you know, Illinois or whatnot, and they have an enormous amount of person identifiable information in school records, um, welfare case studies, what's going on with the children, health records, and so on. And they have incentives to share this, even for things like just getting their state government to work better. Can they understand the cases better? Can they identify children who are possibly being exposed to abuse better if they're able to say, look at the school records and tie it into welfare payments and so on? So they have sort of very concrete reasons they want to share the data. Um, but that also exposes it, like you pointed out, to um, a potential for researchers. Once these, these data are being sort of made available and shared across different agencies, can they be also shared with researchers? So the project that I'm involved in is exactly templating what the contract should look like. And, um, and so we have two sets, one agreements when you're putting your data into sort of the sort of pool or repository and blending it with the other um, um, research. And then the other contract is for the research or the user on the other side, what they're actually agreeing to and sort of sharing and downstream tracking and so on. It's all very new. So you are right on the cutting edge of what uh, people are, are doing and thinking and what, what they need. But I, that's exactly the right question. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so I'm interested in the case when the paper itself has more open license than, than the license for your code and your data. So for example, if you're working for Microsoft and you cannot share your code, yeah. uh, but you still publish in a journal that is completely open, um, isn't there a contradiction to the, to the fact that I agree with that you're paper is more like a snapshot of your research. The advertising. And yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Good word, thank you. Yes, so there's a huge Do you know of particular cases in which there is some workaround for that when we want to reproduce the work of uh, some Yamaha or Microsoft project um, in which part of the code or there is some mechanism that allows to, to share their code in an open journal? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's a very interesting question because normally it's the other way around. Normally the journal is very tight around copyright and nobody has really noticed or cares about the code. So the researcher shares the code because they just wrote some MATLAB scripts or whatever it is themselves and, or R scripts or whatnot and they just share them. Uh, you're talking about the reverse where you actually have, say, a permissive um, open journal open access journal, and then they've relied on some proprietary codes that aren't uh, shareable. Um, so that's, um, I don't think the journal would actually try to exert leverage. Maybe, maybe they're starting to, but I don't think they would over the code. Um, but we can do things like, uh, so what I would, so if I really, really can't share the code, like, and I, you try all the charm and negotiation with Microsoft that you can, and you still can't get the code open, the, the next thing I would like to do is um, set up a series of tests that help me understand how the code is running and how it works. So I can sort of start to glean what those core operations actually are in the code. It's maybe not as good as having it open to play with myself, but at least that's sort of a step in the direction. Um, and, then, and then the other issue is sort of cultural in thinking about how we um, as a community engage with um, our collaborators and making sure from the beginning that we're going to be able to share the products or at least do the best we can in terms of sharing the products. Right now we kind of don't really do that so you're probably running into papers where it, someone else has just made it difficult to, 
get a hold of the code. Um, it doesn't take Microsoft or a company to make it hard to get a hold of the code. Just try it on any old paper. It's really hard. <laughs> but we're, but we're, we're changing and we're, and we're moving. And I think that um, uh, sort of education around these issues and, and discussions, and, and I, I'm seeing the journal standards around what they accept in terms of code and data rapidly changing. It's not to the level that you're describing there, but um, in terms of full openness, but it's rapidly getting there. And I think this type of thing, here's my prediction. Five years, seven years, it won't be acceptable to publish this anymore. But we've got this black hole right now before we get there. <laughs> Yeah. This is a problem that is, is, uh, is becoming more common, and, and it's, a, it's, it's about the instrument that is used to do the analysis of the data. So we in computer science, we have a big problem right now doing or replicating, let's say, the research of uh, Google because we don't have the resources. Yeah, in science, yeah. also exists because well, it's you have actually super in the hard sciences too, teachers. when you have a huge telescope or something. That's right, yeah. right, right. So, what is the direction that is going in? So, so what is the thought? a very interesting about? question. Um, I, that worries, actually. I think I, I've heard these discussions in computer science, like for example, in the Science Directorate at, at NSF. It used to be the case 20 years ago that people came into computer science in academia because that was where the coolest machines were the most cutting edge um, implementations, the biggest scale, and, um, and now we can't hold a candle to Google and Facebook. And, and when I teach um, uh, things like data science and so on, we don't even have scale for a real implementation of Hadoop, for example. And so people say things like, well, I'd like to know Scala, Hadoop, because I want to go work at Google and so on. And even the training is not, I can't train them on a Google-like system before they go, for example. And so, um, so then the question is, yeah, so that, that there's this kind of like whole entire access to resources that I don't see that changing actually in, in academia. So when you have sort of a unique instrument, for me, my approach would be, it, it, there isn't a, a known solution that I, that I know of at least, um, but my approach would be to try to see, well, what can I do that's similar? Basically build analogies and how different is it and where do I expect sort of error to creep in when I'm actually mimicking that, um, that sort of larger instrument. But um, instrument availability is a problem. It's actually one of the reasons I stay away from empirical reproducibility because you need sort of the bench or the tools and so on, and that makes reproducibility much harder than if I'm just sort of passing around software or data. So it's a, it's a very hard problem. So these this, uh, supercomputer centers that are usually planned by uh, governments or go government funding situations, so is it that maybe possible that through uh, government support we can replicate at least partially these uh, instruments that are somehow used? In Maybe. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question, but also think about the architectures. They're totally different in the two settings. If you think about what Google and Facebook are doing, they're not using supercomputing. Maybe, they, maybe IBM has a couple or something. Um, what they're, they're all doing distributed computing. And this what is... What I'm saying is using the same, the same type of programs to develop these, uh, no, so, so instead of supercomputer centers, data centers, let's say. Okay. I don't see that. <laughs> I have an affiliation with NCSA at Illinois, and there are communities around these supercomputers. I don't think they're going anywhere, but it is something I think about a lot. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, leave it here. Uh, so really, thank you very oh, thank much you. Uh, for this thank talk. You.